Okay, Shabbat Shalom and welcome to today's Torah portion, which is titled Miketz. Miketz, which means after those days or afterwards or something in that sense, kind of uh, speaking about something that's finalizing or almost the, close to finality. So, but before we start, I would like to say the blessing for the tour portion, which says, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshano bemitzvotav vetzivano, laasok bedibrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with commandments and commanded us to engage ourselves in the words of the Torah. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, so today's Torah portion is found in the book of Bereshit or Genesis chapter 41, verse 1 through chapter 44, verse 17. And as you recall, last time we had Joseph had interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. And we know that what he said, exactly the way he said it came to be. So now we find, we find Joseph this time, it's been two years later, and now Pharaoh is the one who's having a dream which he cannot interpret. So eventually we know that Joseph will be summoned and from there forward, we'll see all the things that happen. But one thing that we need to understand is since now we have Joseph in Egypt and, and the uh, people of Israel are going to be in Egypt for at least 210 years as slaves. We know that the prophecy spoke about 400 years, but we need to understand that out of those 400 years, 210 were as slaves. And so we're going to be reading about Egypt for uh, several chapters in the book of Genesis. Therefore, it's important that we get a foundation or at least some knowledge about the land of Egypt and the culture and all the things that they believed and how life was lived in Egypt. So the Torah portion starts in chapter 41 saying after which is Miketz after two whole years Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile first of all we need to know who is Pharaoh the word Pharaoh in in Egyptian means it's it's Pera Pera which is translated as great house a great house and originally it was a, a term used for the palace of the king, but as time passed by, Pharaoh then became the name of the king of Egypt. So Pharaoh means great house and then was used as a title for the king. Now, one of the things we need to understand that in Egypt, Pharaoh was considered to be a God and a king. He had both functions as a God and a king. He was also called the son of Ra, the son of Ra, and Ra we know is the major god of Egypt. In relationship, he's, uh, his symbol is the sun. And so the name Ra, we're going to see that the name Ra is found in many of the names of the Egyptian kings, because that was part of their name. Also in their seals, they had these seals were also the name of Ra, was included in those seals. And it was also believed that Pharaoh was a reincarnation of Horus. Horus was a god, son of Osiris. And Osiris was believed to be the first king of the world, not just Egypt, but of the world. And Pharaoh was seen as the protector, as the, as the father of Egypt, as the one that unified the nation as the one that basically gave, gave life to the nation and to its people. So Pharaoh is a very important individual in the eyes of the Egyptians. And then we have him dreaming that he's standing by the Nile. Another thing that we need to understand is that the Nile River is the largest river in all Egypt. It goes basically from the north to the south of the land, dividing the land into east and west. And the Nile, the people understood that the, from the Nile came forth the land of Egypt. Basically, the Nile gave birth to the land of Egypt. And they also saw the land as being uh, a life, I mean, the Nile as being a life-giving river. And they believed that there was a god of the Nile 
that every time there was a flooding, because the flooding was uh, at least once a year, the Nile flooded, and that was seen as a blessing because as the Nile flooded the land, once the water receded, all the minerals would be on the land and that would help them for fertilizing the land and for their harvest. So they believe that every time the Nile over flooded, it was because it meant the arrival of the God happy. Happy was the name of the God. It's interesting, they also had other gods within that lived in the Nile, for example, the hippopotamus, the name of the God that was symbolized by hippopotamus was Tauret. And Tauret was the God that favored uh, pregnant women. It, he would help, or, uh, it was a goddess. He would help the pregnant women to have good labor and to not to have any problems during labor. And then there was the crocodile. The crocodile also, the name of the god represented by the crocodile was named Sobek, Sobek. Now, the thing about the animals, you know, sometimes we think that they uh, worshiped animals and it wasn't that the Egyptians worshiped animals. The animals were seen as symbols of the attributes of the gods. It was related as at, uh, symbols of the attributes of the gods. For example, a lion. Most times we relate a lion with the attribute of strength. Therefore, depending on, a, on a, the attribute of a god, they would associate, associate the head of a lion with that god. And so sometimes we see pictures where you have the human body, but the head, let's say it's a lion or a crocodile. If it's a crocodile, what they saw about the crocodile was the attribute of being ferocious, of being a ferocious animal. So you would see the, the body of a human, but the head of a crocodile. So that was symbolizing that attribute of that particular God. So it's not that they worshiped the animals, but they saw these, the attributes of these animals as symbols of the attributes of the gods. For example, uh, we know that Pharaoh used to wear a, uh, a snake over his head. The, the snake, uh, one of the attributes that they uh, considered of the snake is protection. So the snake over the head of the pharaoh, is, it has to do with protection. Okay? So th these things are kind of uh, important to know because once we get into the plagues and we see the things that are going to happen with the people of Israel, we'll see why the reactions of God towards the Egyptians based on the plagues and why he did the things the way he did it, because it has to do with their understanding and their beliefs. Okay. So going back to chapter 41, verse two, it says, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. Now, even the cows, they associated the cows with the attribute of tenderness because cows are very tender with their young. So that would be an attribute of a specific God. So he's seeing seven cows, which are beautiful. And then in verse three says, and behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. Now you have to understand that if the Nile is a, a river that promotes life, why is he seeing two things that are so opposite? Verse four, and the ugly thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows and Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning, his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And so why is his spirit troubled? Like I was saying, if the Nile represents life, why is he seeing these opposite things? Cows, some that look beautiful, other that looks terrible and the, and the terrible ones eat the, the good ones. And then you see the grain. Or so. so he's kind of like wondering what's going on. So he calls the magicians and wise men. Why? Because as we said the last time in this, in this culture during this time, 
the people believed that dreams came forth from the gods. The only problem was that the gods never gave an explanation or interpretation of the dreams. So that's why in Egypt, they had books related to the interpretation of dreams, of symbols. And so these magicians, which really were like priests, they were a specific group of priests, along with the wise men were the ones that would study these books in trying to interpret dreams. But in this case, they're not able. It says, Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. In other words, interpret them correctly, because I'm sure they gave him all, the, all these ideas of what this could mean, but they were, it was not sufficient for Pharaoh. Verse nine, then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I each having a dream with his own interpretation. A young Hebrew, again, remembering that the term Hebrew was offensive to the Egyptians. They saw the Hebrews as a lower class of people. To them, the Hebrews were abominable because of their beliefs and their customs. So he says, a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted it to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Yosef, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Now, another thing we need to understand about the culture is that the men were clean shaven. They were shaved, their haircuts were very short, and usually the magicians and the priests, uh, they shaved completely their heads. So there was a way to distinguish the Egyptians from other people. And so they shave completely. Uh, Joseph, which he probably was, had a beard and had long hair. So they, they shave his beard, they, they cut his hair, they put clean clothes, they bathe him. Because imagine he's coming directly from a prison to see Pharaoh. So he has to be in a presentable manner. Verse 15, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh. Now this is very important because he says, it is not in me, God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Again, remember that the Egyptians believed that the dreams did come from the gods, but the gods never interpreted a dream. And yet Joseph is telling Pharaoh that it is God, his God, who is going to interpret the dream for Pharaoh. So Joseph answered Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream I was standing. So he tells the whole dream and we're not going to read it all over again because he tells exactly what we had read before. So in chapter 20 and verse 25, it says, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one, because remember he had two dreams. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now remember that Joseph is referring to the God of Israel. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow for it will be very severe. Another thing we have to remember that if the Nile did not overflow as usual every year, there will be famine. So famine was something that had happened before in, in Egypt. It's not the first time. The only thing is that this famine is going to last seven years and it's going to be the worst of them all. Verse 32. 
And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. So again, Joseph is telling Pharaoh because he dreamed the same dream. I mean, it's, there's not exactly, but the same theme is, is the same one in both dreams because it happened twice. Joseph is telling him that this is something that is really and truly coming forth because God has, has told him. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. So Joseph here, besides explaining the dream, he also gives him a solution. So he goes forth and tells Pharaoh that he, to, he needs to find a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. This would be what's called a, I think it's, you say it, vizier or something like that. It's, it's kind of like a, a second in command, someone that is second in command. Like for example, we have a president and vice president. This person will be like the vice president, second in command to Pharaoh. Verse 34 of chapter 41. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. In other words, he's going to tax the people 20% of what they harvest and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. So he gives them a solution. He says, find someone that's going to be like a supervisor, have uh, governors all over the land, making sure that the grain is harvested and it's taxed 20%, that everybody brings the grain, 20% of their grain, and this is going to be saved in storehouses. Verse 37, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Now, again, we have to understand that he's not talking about the gods of Egypt. He's talking about the God of Joseph. He understands that the God of Joseph is the one that's revealing to him the dream, the interpretation of the dream, and that this God is in the spirit of is within Joseph. Verse 39, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. Because again, we have to remember that they believe that God's never gave the interpretation. That's why he had magicians and priests and books about dreams so they could interpret them. But here, Joseph is showing that his God not only gives you the dream, but he also interprets the dream. Verse 40, you shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring. Now the things we're going to read here are the elements of an enthronement because basically he's enthroning Joseph to a position second to the king. So he gives him his signet ring, and we have to understand that the signet ring was a seal. Without that seal, Pharaoh could not decree anything. Anytime that Pharaoh decreed something, he had to seal it with his signet ring, and that made it legal. And once it was made legal and the decree went out, it could never be changed. This was a powerful form of, author of authority. So Joseph is getting the signet ring. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and closed them in garments of fine linen. Again, fine linen were, was worn by people of wealth, by the kings, by the priests. So this was clothing that was very significant in terms of a social status. He has given him honor. He has given him authority and put a gold chain about his neck. It was a custom in, in Egypt and in, in many cultures to put a, a chain of gold around the neck of the individual. Again, this is a form of status change. It's elevating his status socially, politically, and giving him honor. Again, this shows authority. 
And some of these things, if you remember, recall the story of Esther and Mordecai and Purim, the same thing the king does with Mordecai. So he gives the signet ring. So all these things have to do with elevation of honor, of social status, and political status. Verse 43, and he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out before him, bow the knee, thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. In other words, a proclamation. Once the king has been enthroned, or the individual has been enthroned, there is a proclamation that has to go out. That is why when Yeshua comes back, there's going to be a, a blowing of the sofar and a proclamation that he is king. You have to remember that in terms of parallels with Yeshua, Joseph is the uh, person that most resembles the life of Yeshua. Verse 44. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Why does he say that? Because Joseph didn't know who he was? No. The term, every time the term is, he says, I am Pharaoh, what he's saying is the following. That I can say what, what I have said because my position as Pharaoh upholds the authority of my words. That is why sometimes when you're reading the Torah, it says, I am Hashem. I Hashem, because he's, what, what Hashem is saying is, I can say what I have said because my position as sovereign king of the universe upholds my authority to say and do what I have said. So just saying that term, I am Pharaoh, denotes authority, denotes that his position as Pharaoh, his words are upheld by his position. So I am Pharaoh and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. In other words, he's telling everybody, after me, only Joseph has the same authority. Verse 45, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Safenat Panea. So there's a change of name. Why? Again, a change of status. He's being elevated. Remember Abraham. He was Abram, was changed to Abraham. Sarai was changed to Sarah. Uh, Joshua or Hoshia was changed to Yehoshua and so forth. So all these name changes, even Jacob was changed to Israel. All these name changes repre represent an elevation of status. In the cases of the patriarchs, elevation of spiritual and physical status. So here Pharaoh is elevating even more the status of Joseph. And he says, and he gave him in marriage Asenat, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of An. Why? Because the priesthood had a high social status in the eyes of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the one that took care of the priesthood. And by giving Joseph not only political elevation, he's also giving him religious elevation, religious honor. So Joseph has both positions as an important person within the empire of Pharaoh, but also in terms of the beliefs and the religion of Egypt. So that's why he marries him to a daughter of a priest. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Why? To see, it, to know exactly how things were so that he can uh, manage what he just has, what he just had proposed to Pharaoh. Verse 46, now Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You have to remember also that Yeshua was 30 years old when he started his ministry. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly and he gathered up all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt and put the food in the cities. He put in every city, the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Before the year famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenat, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the first from Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my hardship in all my father's house. 
the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So these names are associated. Manasseh was forgetful, forgetting. You have to remember all the hardship that he went through with his brothers and being taken out of his land and, and of his father's home. So all these things he wants to forget. And Ephraim has to do with abundance of fruit. Verse 53, the seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come as Joseph had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. Also, we need to understand that during this time, Egypt is the empire that's ruling over all the ancient Near East. So all the lands, all the countries around Egypt are under the rule of Egypt. So Egypt is an empire. Egypt is the one that has dominance over all this area during this time. And it says there was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to do, you do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. So this grain was to be sold, not just given, had to be sold. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Now chapter 42. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, behold, I have heard there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Remember that when he sent Joseph to go after his brothers to check on them, we know what happened. He disappeared. So he's afraid that something like that might happen to Benjamin too, which was the son of Rachel. And we always have to remember that he favored Rachel, he favored Joseph, and he favored Benjamin. Verse 5, thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. It's interesting how it changes from Jacob to Israel. Remember that every time that the name of Israel is used, it means that this has to do with a higher status in terms of spirituality. So this is very important. Verse 6, now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. So here we see the fulfillment, the starting of the fulfillment of the dreams that Joseph had, which he related to his brothers, and they mocked him to the point that they hated him because of these dreams. So they bowed to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. The same thing happened with Yeshua. The religious leaders could not recognize that he was the Messiah. So that's another parallel with Joseph and Yeshua. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them, and he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. Now we have to understand that uh, Joseph is speaking in Egyptian and there's an interpreter because they don't know that he is not an Egyptian. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of the one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. He said to them, no, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. Why? Because it was it used to happen that other nations would send spies to see the weaknesses of Pharaoh and his land. So what he's saying up to a certain point is true. So he is really, you know, even though he knows who they are, he's, he's messing with them. Because remember of all the things they did to him. So he's, he's, he's already starting to test them to see if they have changed at all from what they were when they did what they did to him. And so... 
verse 12, he said to them, no, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, young, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, it is as, as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested by the life of Pharaoh, which here that means he's making a, a, an oath. And you have to remember that the oath were made in names of their gods and Pharaoh is like a god to the Egyptians. He said, by the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. In other words, he put them in prison for three days. Remember they had thrown him into a cistern and then he was thrown into a prison. So he's letting them kind of feel what he felt when they did that to him. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live for I fear God. Of course, he's talking about the God of Israel, but they don't know that. He's probably, the, his brothers probably think he's referring to the gods of Egypt. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your household and bring your youngest brother to me. So your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. So Reuben now is, is uh, complaining and saying it's their fault because they didn't listen to him. So now it's a back and forth thing. Oh, no, it was your fault. No, it was my fault and, and so forth. Because now all of a sudden they're seeing that what's happening is a consequence of what they did to Joseph when they sold him. And they had thrown him in the pit and then he was sold. Verse 23, they did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept, and he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Of course, he cries, I mean, because he's hearing what's going on. It's his brothers, people he has, his brothers he hasn't seen in ages. Remember, he was taken out of Canaan when he was 17, and now he's more than 30 years old. All those years without seeing his brothers and his family and hearing what, what's going on between them. But he takes Simeon and puts him in prison. Why Simeon? The only th thing I can think of is because Simeon, Reuben, Judah, and Levi are all four brothers, same mother, same father. And so he says, if they're as close as they used to be, let's see what's going to happen, how they're going to deal with this issue. Verse 25, and Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this, their hearts failed them and they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? I mean, all these things are happening. They're still thinking that this is because of what they did to Joseph. And then now God is taking revenge of what they did to Joseph. When they came to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them saying, the man, the Lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, we are honest men. We have never been spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me, then I shall know that you are not spies but honest men, and I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. 
And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And now you will take Benjamin. All this has come against me. So now Jacob thinks that all these things are happening because of him, of his actions. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. So imagine the anguish again of poor Jacob that now Simeon is not there, Joseph is not there, and he's thinking that he will also lose his son, Benjamin, son of Rachel. Chapter 43. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, now, now we see that is Judah who's taking the lead with all the situation. Remember, Reuben tried to, to, to do that. But in spite of what Reuben said, you know, I'm willing for you to even kill my two children if I don't bring Simeon back or Benjamin back. But his father said, no, no, no one's going back to Egypt. But yet, jo uh, Jacob doesn't follow through with Reuben because now it's Judah who's taking the lead with this situation. And it says, but Judah said to him, the man solemnly warned us saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down for the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel, not Jacob, Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was in answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and we'll arise and go that we may live and not die. Both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. And we know that up to a certain point, Judah is responsible for what happened to Joseph. Because he was the one saying, let's kill him. And then he said, no, 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 let's sell him and make some money out of the situation. So truly, he is the one that's to blame for. Verse 10, if we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, mare, pistachio, nuts, and almonds. In other words, take a tribute because you cannot go in front, face a person like Pharaoh with your, aunt, with your hands empty. You have to always bring a gift, some sort of tribute. And these are things that were not easily grown or available in Egypt. So they're very special gift that Israel is sending to Pharaoh or to Joseph. Take double the money with you, carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again to the man. May El Shaddai, it's not God Almighty, it's May El Shaddai, Grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your brother and Benjamin. As for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So at this point, Israel is kind of like, you know, he's, he's, he's given up in the sense, if this is my fate, then let it be so. But we need food, because imagine if they don't go down to get more food, more grain, is the, all the tribes, all the children, all the families are going to die of hunger. So the men took this present and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. Another thing we have to understand that even though from one verse to another, it sounds like they were there the next day, 
This is a long trip. This is months of travel. So they have to have caravans of camels and food and water to get there. So it's probably easily anywhere from three to six months to get there. Verse 16, when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. Again, remember what we said before that the animals uh, symbolize attributes of the gods. So animals up to a certain point were considered sacred. And so in Egypt, they didn't eat a lot of meat. Meat was eaten only on special occasions. So when Joseph asked the steward to kill an animal, to slaughter an animal, because it's going to be for dinner, he's letting him know this is a very, very special occasion. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house and they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they're still afraid. They're thinking, you know, it's because they, they probably thought that we stole the money, that we didn't pay, that we stole the food. Because, I mean, he, they're being invited to, Pharaoh, to Joseph's house, who's second to Pharaoh, who's a very important man. Verse 19, so they went up to the, uh, to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke to with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has been put treasure in your, hacks, in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. In other words, Joseph paid for the food, gave them back their own money. And so now Simeon, is back in their presence. Now you have to remember that many months have gone by. So Simeon was all this time in prison. I'm sure he was treated well, but still he was in prison like Joseph had been in prison for so, such a long time. Verse 24, and when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water and they had washed their feet and we had given their donkey's fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon for they heard that they should eat bread more. I mean, he bred there. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. Again, they're bowing down to Joseph. And he inquired about their welfare and said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, your servant, our father is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. Again, this means that completely to the floor, they're bowing down to Joseph, like exactly like what he had dreamed. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother, Benjamin, his mother's son and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out for his compassion grew warm for his brother and he sought a place to weep. And he entered this chamber and wept there. Imagine the last time he saw Benjamin, Benjamin was a little boy. And now he's a grown man. And, you know, he's, he's his true brother in the sense that is of the same mother, of the same father. And, and, you know, he just can't control what he's feeling for his brother. And, of course, he can't let them know who he is. So he runs out and cries. And it says in verse 31, then he washed his face and came out and controlling himself said, serve the food. Because I'm sure he was, he just was, was wanting to let them know who he was. They served him by himself and then by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. That's why they didn't even eat with Joseph because they knew that Joseph was a foreigner, that he was a Hebrew, but his brothers don't know that. So they all sit separately. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Why? Because they sat them exactly in the order of their birth. And they're wondering, how do they know this? 
Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. So he gives Joseph, uh, Benjamin five times more than the other brothers, maybe trying to see if they were going to be jealous, if they were going to argue, and they were going to say, how come you got more and we got less? But that didn't happen. So again, he's th seeing there a change in the attitude of his brothers, especially Benjamin being a son of Rachel. Chapter 44. Then he commanded the steward of his house, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack and put my cup, the silver cup in the mouth of the sack of the youngest was his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. Now here at silver during this time, Egypt did not have silver. It was, Egypt had gold. So therefore the silver during this time for Egypt was more valuable than gold. So when Joseph's cup is made out of silver, it's because it's more valuable than had it been a cup of gold. Verse three, as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, up, follow after the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination, you have done evil in doing this. So apparently this cup was used for divination, and there was one custom in Egypt that was done, which meant, because remember he's, he was married to a daughter of a priest, and the priesthood had other functions like magicians and diviners and things like that. So was Joseph, he has this cup, which apparently what they did is they would spill drink on a plate. And depending on how the drink spread out, they could read or divine things. They could kind of know the future and stuff like that. When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. They said to him, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouth of our sacks, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we still steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? In other words, we not only brought back the money that was put in our sacks, we brought again money to buy. So why would you think we would do such a thing? Verse nine, whichever of your servants is found with it shall die. And we also will be my Lord's servants. So here they speak. Remember like when Jacob spoke to Laban, that if Laban found uh, the, his idols among the, the property of Jacob, that whoever had it should die. Remember, he didn't know that Rachel had taken them. So here, they think they're innocent, that this is not true. And so they make this, this oath that whoever and whomever they find this cup, that that person is to die and they will become slaves. Verse 10, he said, let it be as you say, he who is found with it shall be my servant and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground and each man opened his sack. And he searched beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. Remember that tearing their clothes is a sign of anguish of mourning, of grief, because they can't believe well, what is just happening. Verse 14, when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground again. Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And Judah said, again, remember that it's Judah who's taking the lead the same way he took the lead to make sure that Joseph was sold. Now he's taking the lead in trying to defend himself and his brothers. What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. In other words, he's, Joseph is saying, I'll keep 
Benjamin and you guys can go back to your home. And remember that that was Jacob's worst nightmare that also he would lose Benjamin. So Judah here is like, of course, we will know this in the next Torah portion next week. But Judah's like, this cannot happen. I mean, I can't leave Benjamin. We all need to stay. So Joseph is really, really having uh, a time. I won't say it was, uh, he was doing it. I think he was doing it because he's testing his brothers. He's testing to see if they have changed. He's testing to see how they're going to deal with Benjamin how they're going to deal with each other. Because remember that when he was growing up, there was a lot of division among them because they were all from different moms and, and, and the maid servants. And so even though they all had the same father, they had four different mothers. So they were not very close to each other. And remember that they hated Joseph because he was the favorite of Jacob. And now Benjamin, who's also the son of Rachel, the brother of Joseph. So He's testing them. He's trying to see if his brothers have changed. And so in the next Torah portion, we'll see the outcome of what Joseph is doing to his brothers. So now we're going to take a time for any questions.